Hello, everybody. I'm so excited about tonight. You have no idea how um, how powerful this is going to be. It's going to be extremely, extremely good. So I hope that you brought a brand new notebook. I mean, I have mine. I don't know about y'all, but I don't, I don't, I don't play. I have my notebook. I have my pen. I have, um, I'm just so excited about tonight. You have no idea. And one of the reasons I'm most excited about tonight is just because just while I was in prayer, you know, people always call, call it the breakers anointing. And it's in Isaiah that people use as that scripture, but I kind of went moseying over there last night in prayer and it didn't say breakers anointing. And I was a little disappointed at that. Uh, but uh there is a scripture that talks about the breaker it's the word is broken down to breaker and i'll talk a little bit about that later but what i kept hearing god say is like this is going to be a breaker Th tonight is going to be a breaking for you and um and i know that there's a lot of hindrances to breakthrough and a lot of things that come in the path of breakthrough and you feel like you fasted you prayed you've sold, you've gone to church, you've done all the things in the Bible that you can think to do. You've confessed the word of God. Uh, your faith might be a little shabby, but you feel like grace can fill in where everything else didn't work at. And you're like, where is my breakthrough? Why hasn't anything come to pass? What am I doing wrong? Well, wait no further. Tonight is the night you're going to get the answer for that. And uh, what I love most about God is um, in the very little I know about him, because I'll be learning about God till I'm over 100 is that God wants us to have the answers to our prayers. And I think a lot of the times because we put God in a box and uh, we've defined him based off of, off of our very limited human thinking that we think God is just this demonic taskmaster who wants to uh, put us through slavery and try to figure out these answers. And that's not the truth. There's so many things that are in the way of your answer. And one of the things that there's two different scriptures in the Bible. One says, deliver me speedily. And the other one said, answer me speedily. And I just know that God wants us to have the answer because he wants us to live a life, a breakthrough, and he wants us to stand in the promises that he's created for us. Um, I, uh, what am I going to say next? One of my, okay, let me say this. Our teacher tonight is Minister Kevin Ewing. And uh, for those of you that have followed me for a while know that I don't like introducing y'all to nobody. Okay. It's no surprise. However, uh, I am, uh, I, what I know for sure is that Kevin Ewing is a very sharp Bible teacher. And I believe these days we need teachers like never before uh, who love the truth, which is what Minister Kevin loves, who loves God, which Minister Kevin loves, who loves the word of God, which Minister Kevin loves. And one of the things that I love is that I didn't realize him and I kind of just taught on so many of the things that are very similar, like giving to the poor during a fast. We don't necessarily hear that talk. I don't, so I don't wanna uh, put that out there that other people aren't teaching that, but I don't hear often uh, to give to the poor, especially during a time of fast. And just even knowing that your fast doesn't even count if you don't give to the poor. And uh, I learned that he teaches on that. And I think that's so powerful. And also, I think because we live in such a, uh, we have so many people that believe in the grace dispensation, which I am a big beneficiary of God's grace, right? Like if God's grace <laughs> did not hit me, I don't know where I would be. And so God's grace has definitely been a blessing for me. However, we do know that people pervert that grace message. And we have a lot of people that don't believe that curses exist today. And, uh, and but it, they do. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are still suffering from curses that they don't believe exist. But anytime you see patterns in the family bloodline, whether that's patterns of everybody gets mental illness or everybody gets cancer or everybody dies, at, all the men die at 50 after a heart attack or everybody's promiscuous or uh, molestation or incest, that is a big indicator that th those are curses on the bloodline. And whenever you see yourself kind of in cycles, every five years, this thing happens. Every 10 years, certain certain things happen in your personal life. Those are indicators that curses are at the forefront and these things need to be broken. And the longer you pretend that they don't exist, the longer that you, not just you, but your children's children are going to suffer from these things. And so I'm so excited for tonight. Um, this is this is a night of breakthrough. And uh, what I know for sure is that your prayers will be answered 
tonight. And I just want you to make sure that you apply the word of God to what is being taught. Now, uh, I will say this before I bring them up. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, stories in the Bible is 2 Kings chapter 3, right? And this is a story of um, Jehoshaphat, who Jezebel's son, Jeroboam, asked him to go to war with him, right? And uh, we all know Jezebel. We all know Ahab. And uh, his son, their son says, go to war with me because they're getting ready to come kill me. And because they're going to, you live close by, they're going to kill you too. We know people that kind of band together because they have enemies that are enemies, right? So they don't necessarily like each other, but because they have the same enemy, they have joined forces to try to kill this enemy. Jehoshaphat goes to war with him and he realizes he's in the desert with no food, no water. His cattle are getting ready to die. His beasts are getting ready to die. The men are getting ready to die because how do you survive in a desert with no water? And he finds himself there. But one thing I love about Jehoshaphat is he realized he made the wrong decision and he did a course correction. He said, hey, I didn't make the right decision. We need to go see a prophet. And so they went to go see prophet Elisha. Right. And we all know what happened with prophet Elijah, who was like his father. What happened was Jezebel tried to kill him. So Je Elisha had a spicy attitude and was like, I don't even like y'all like that. You should go talk to the prophets of your mammy and daddy talking to Jeroboam, his, you know, because Jezebel had her own false prophets. And, uh, you know, he was like, no, we need to see you because we don't have the answer. And the Bible says that uh, he said, bring me my minstrel. And when he brought him his minstrel, the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he said, go and make this valley full of ditches. And he said, uh, you're not going to see any wind and you won't see any rain, but this is but a light thing for me to do. Meaning in the desert, I want you to take the energy that you don't have because you're already weak. You have no faith anymore, but I want you to dig these. I want you to dig the desert full of ditches. And the deeper you dig in faith, the more I'm going to pour this water in. But here's the catch. You're not going to see any wind or rain. So there's going to be no proof that this stuff is coming. But this is going to be easy for me to do. Here's the thing. They dug the ditches. They And he said, I'm going to give you into the hand of the Moabites. They dug the ditches. The waters were full. And what I loved about this is that the, the provision act also acted as protection. Because in the morning time, when the enemy woke up, they saw red. And they thought that they had died. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have always stopped this story at this point. And many of you have always heard me stop this story at this point. But recently, over the last two months or so, God has been having me um, study about evil altars in a way that I know God is like, there's something about evil altars that is on the mind of God, I'm sure all the time, but for me right now. And I've just been doing a deep study of this. So imagine this scripture that you read all, I mean, my favorite story in the Bible, basically. And I missed this part that God said, I'm going to give you into the hand of the Moabites. And all this time, I thought that they won this war. But when the enemy realized that they were getting ready to beat them, the king of this, the, the leader of this army sacrificed his son. The Bible says, hey, just take my son. I'm going to sacrifice him. And then when he dies, because that, that altar has been fed with a life, they did not win that war. I didn't know that. Imagine that evil altars are so powerful. And God uh, and Minister Kevin is going to talk about it, that altars are so powerful. Covenants made with altars are so powerful. and God. God respects covenant so much that he honors the covenant, whether it's good or bad, until we take authority and we break it in the name of Jesus Christ. So what I thought was so powerful was that even though he had given them this war, when this covenant was now, when this evil covenant was now uh, erected, the altar was erected by the bloodshed of this human son, they lost the war because of it. And so I want to let you know right now that if you see any evil patterns in your life, uh, anything at all. And he's going to talk about that a lot more. There is an evil altar at play in your life that needs to be destroyed, needs to be dismantled, needs to be torn down, needs to be plucked up, needs to be rooted out. It needs to be gone. Okay. And then it needs to be, uh, you know, we have a living sacrifice. We are the living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. So you don't have to go out and kill nobody because Jesus died on the cross. He has the perfect one. But you're like, Tiffany, why do I have to do all this? Didn't Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Of course he did. But you still got to forgive people. 
So if Jesus died on the cross for our sins, why do we still have to forgive if forgiveness doesn't matter anymore? Why do we have to still give to the poor if Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins? So we don't want to get like, just don't come with an open mind. Come with the word of God in mind and just listen to what's being said and line it up with scripture. Minister Kevin Ewing. Hello, Hello. there. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. Welcome. Beautiful. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so great glad you're here. We're so excited to have you. Y'all, if I thought that there was another person out there like me as far as how he gets to the word and how he gets to the people and how, I mean, I love every second of it. So I am, I, you know how people have celebrities that they're excited about? Say it again. You know how people have like celebrities that they're excited about? Yes, yes. I'm excited about teachers who preach the word and truth. Oh, beautiful. I love that. I am. So I'm very excited about tonight. So. <laughs> okay. So how you want to dissect this tonight? <laughs> so I want you to start with altars. I want you to start with what an altar is at a very okay. elementary level. All right. And then I want you to go through, you know, five to 10 scriptures about altars, about how Beautiful. God honors evil altars, even, mm -hmm. even if it's a bad covenant and how other altars, you know, Gideon and Abraham and things of that nature. And mm -hmm. then we're going to go into Q and A because I want to make sure people's specific altars are broken. Um, okay. And I want them to walk away with being able to know how do I get rid of this tonight? Mm -hmm. Well, let me just add this. Uh, Covering this topic of altars is very, very broad. So I'm going to do my best to condense it tonight. This may be even go into a part two. I don't know. But it's I'm going to do the best that I can tonight to uh, facilitate those who are looking for a breakthrough. So I'm going to really focus more on that. <clears throat> now, as it relates to altars, before we even get to the altars, let me just stick this in there. Uh, there's a scripture in uh, Proverbs 11, 9b. And it says that through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Now, that scripture is going to be very important going forward because what I'm going to do here, you're going to see that your breakthrough isn't going to come because you uh, blow a shofar. Your breakthrough is going to come because you wear a, a scarf. Your breakthrough is going to come because you sow the seed. Your breakthrough is going to come before because you swing on the church chandelier. Your breakthrough is going to come through the retrieving of the knowledge of God, which is his word, and then the application of that. Now, the quality of your breakthrough will be solely dependent on how much of the word you apply. In other words, you, Prophet Tiffany, and myself, have we don't deliver people. We don't give them the breakthroughs. The same way we got it, which is delve into the word of God and make it applicable, that's the same way they're going to get it, all right? So with that said, what is an altar? This is powerful. Now, an altar, there are several functions of the altar. <clears throat> and uh, let me just put this up here. And you guys can write this down, okay? The altar is a place where humanity meets with divinity or with spirits. The altar is also a place where sacrifices are made. It's number two. The altar is a place where covenants are established. The altar is a place of worship. This part is interesting. The altar is a place where dreams and visions are produced. You're going to see that tonight too. And ultimately, the purpose of an altar is to change the destiny of a person, a family, a community, a group, even a nation. Now, how does this happen? Well, ultimately, when we put this all together, the altar, and this is the best scenario that I can give you, the altar is, a, is like a portal between the spiritual world and the physical world. And when a human being goes to that altar, and it all depends because the altar can be, uh, there are different types of altar. But for the most part, back in the day of Moses and so on, they would put up rocks and so on or whatever. And they would now have to follow certain rituals or ceremony. And the idea here, based on the ritual or ceremony, is to summon a particular spirit. In the case of Moses and Aaron and those, they were summoning the spirit of God. 
So God gave them a specific, he gave them a specific rule to follow in order when they want to raise an altar towards him. So I want us to look at Exodus chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 22 to verse 26, all right? So Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 22, and it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, Ye have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make unto you gods of gold. Verse 24 of Exodus 20. An altar of earth thou shall make unto me, and thou, sorry, and shall sacrifice thereon thy burnt offering and thy peace offering, thy sheep and thine oxen, in all places, listen to this now, where I record my name, and I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. So several points I want us to, to look at here. So God is saying to Israel, and he's, and this is the, 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 the key about altars, because the spirit that you're trying to summon to that altar is going to give you specific instructions for that spirit to facilitate its will in the, in the earth or in that individual life or whomever they're projecting that spirit at. So the spirit, in this case, God is saying, listen, now if you're going to erect an altar, you're going to take like rocks and stones. It has to be from the earth. You have to do X, Y, Z. Then you put your burnt offering. You put all of the other offerings there. Then he said, once that happened, listen now, God is a spirit. He says, then I will come. If you follow these instructions, this will invite me to this altar. And I'm not going to come empty-handed. This is the key. God is going to come with blessings. So this right here becomes the principles of all altars, no matter how it's done. Because if that is what happens from the kingdom of light side, well, clearly the opposite is true from the kingdom of darkness. So when evil altars are raised for whatever reason, then there are specific strongholds or principalities at that altar that the human being is making an agreement or a covenant with. All right? Now, the, the sad part about this is that this covenant is now going to affect the bloodline of every member that's present at that altar. So this becomes the genesis for generational curses. This becomes the, gen uh, the genesis for evil patterns that's going to come about in a person's life. Now, there are many people listening to me right now, and they would say to me, Kevin, listen, I have done the fast. I've done Daniel fast, Esther fast, Peter Pan fast, Mary Jane fast. Every fast I did. Kevin, I've given to the poor, the, the everybody. And they're saying, Kevin, what is happening? And this here would be clear evidence that there is a covenant that is speaking to your destiny. And until that covenant is broken, it is almost impossible for you to be catapulted into your destiny. So let me just calm down a little bit. I could get a little excited here. Hey, <laughs> okay, so let's go back at this scripture now. So he says here, Verse 24, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offering, and thy peace offering. Now, what does the sacrifice do on the altar? Well, the sacrifice, whether they kill a chick, sorry, a, a, a sheep or whatever, it, it seals the agreement between the spirit and the human. And from that point forward, the spirit have free will in the lives of these people. Now, one would say, now, hold on, back up, Kevin. Now, take your time here. What do you mean God have free will? No man could restrict God's will. That isn't what I said. What I'm saying is that God set rules. And if we go back to Genesis, you could write this down, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 28, uh, Psalms chapter 8, verses 4 to 6, and Psalms 115, I think, verse 6 verse 13 or verse 16. And the underlying tone in all of these verses, it is basically saying that after God created the earth, he gave the keys to this earth to mankind. So mankind will be us, spirit, soul, and body. 
and we are now the landlords of this planet. So what that simply means is that God never, in any of those scriptures I just gave you, gave authority or dominion or rulership to spirits. He gave it to humans. With that being said, any spirit that wants to run its will in this earth has to come through mankind, hence the altars. So people that are into sorcery, and witchcraft, and voodoo, and santeria, and the sangomas, and all of this stuff, when they tap it into the ancestors and so on, the truth is they're tapping into evil spirits. But with each altar, there is a certain ritual that they may follow. For example, there's some people on here right now who, even though they're living right and they're doing what is right, they're still plagued with a spirit of poverty. And they're trying to figure out, now, I'm giving, I'm, I'm doing everything that is required of me according to Scripture. But what they don't know is that the ancestors or someone in the bloodline who wanted to be wealthy or who wanted to have some favor done by the altar, who wanted, like they say in the Caribbean, wanted to buy luck, meaning that they want to be prosperous in life, they would have made a, a covenant with the altar. And so they go to the altar and they say, listen, I want to be wealthy. And the altar will either tell them, bring something or someone that, is, uh, that they love or cherish uh, to sacrifice to this altar, or the altar itself will tell them what they want. Mm. So what they would say is, okay, I want to be wealthy. So what I want to do, I want to sacrifice the destiny of the second generation. So the generation after this person will do quite well in life, will excel in life. But once the second generation come up, all hell is going to break loose. And every last one of them is going to be challenged with financial situations, even though they're college educated, even though they were top of the class, everything is in place physically for them to go forward. But there's something restricting them and this is what brings the frustration to them. How is it that I have an MBA degree, okay? And you have uh, employees just coming on the job who are surpassing me, who I train, and they become my boss. They make far more than me. But I'm seeing this in my cousins. I'm seeing this in my siblings. I'm seeing this in my aunts, my uncles. So that now become the red flags to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. You've fasted, you've prayed, what happened here? The covenant. So you say, well, Kevin, doesn't the Bible says that this kind coming through prayer and fasting? And you're absolutely correct. However, you're still missing the key here. The covenant has yet to be broken. First of all, it's had yet to be recognized. That's right. So God has to honor the covenant. Now let's put a pin in here, okay? Because I got to make this point to come back to my next point. Okay? Write the scripture down. Uh, Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9, well, prior to Joshua chapter 9, Moses, before Joshua took over, repeatedly warned the children of Israel prior to them going into the promised land to make no covenants or marriages with the Canaanites because, you know, they served other gods, Molech, Ashtrod, and all this other stuff, right? He also uh, made it very clear to them. He says, do not have any covenants, period, with them. Do not let your daughters marry their sons, vice versa. So in Joshua chapter 9, after the Gibeonites heard about the children of Israel, they feared them. Now the Gibeonites were the descendants of the Canaanites and the Amorites, all from Canaan, right? And what they decided to do was to disguise themselves as poor people coming from another land. And they've made a deal amongst each other to lie to the children of Israel, whom Joshua at this point was the head of the children of Israel. So immediately when they saw Joshua, they said, you know, we came from a far country looking for rest, what have you. And the next words that came out of their mouth is, forge a covenant with us. So the scripture says that Joshua did not inquire of the Lord and made a covenant with the Gibeonites, whom they were, they were not supposed to do it, right? A few days later, they discovered that these guys lied to them. These are actually descendants of the Canaanites who we were commanded to kill by God. And when they were making plans to kill them, the elders say, no, 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 you, you cannot do that. You swore by God to protect them. 
Now, isn't this interesting? God who told them originally, you must kill them, but God honored the covenant that Joshua and the elders made with them. So if they had killed them, a curse would have come upon Israel. So anyway, this covenant was made. 300 years later, King David is king. I think this is 1 Samuel 21, 1st or 2nd Samuel 21. And they were doing everything according to the ceremonial laws, the Passovers and everything. However, there was a drought in the land. And a drought was uh, symbolic of a curse. That shouldn't be if you're working, doing the things of God. So the Bible says that uh, David inquired of the Lord, well, Lord, what, what? how is this? We are following all your rules, just like believers today. We're doing everything we're asking you to do. And God says, now, hold up, hold up, hold up. The reason why this is a, there's a drought in the land is because King Saul, in his bloodthirstiness, had killed some of the Amor, uh, some of the Gibeonites. Nobody knew. As a result of that, it violated the covenant and therefore a curse which brought about the drought. So God said, I'm not in this. You must now go to the leaders of the Gibeonites and see what they want for the atonement. So David went there and the elders of the Gibeonites says, now listen, in order to fix this, we want seven men from the house of Saul. We don't want no other tribe men. It has to be Saul. So David went and get seven men, and I'm from what I can recall, I think they had beheaded the seven men. <laughs> when they did that, the rains burst from the sky. Here is my point. Many of you listening to me right now, Kevin is making a lot of sense because God knows I have done everything possible. But a lot of you don't realize that you have family members, some that you probably never met way back in 1800s or whatever, and they made covenants for whatever reason but that covenant is still being honored. And it's because of the secrecy of that covenant that nobody knows, that is what's keeping the restrictions spiritually on that person that is causing them not to go forward physically. I'm about to drop a bomb right now. You all ready? I'm ready. You're ready. Good. Because a lot of people are going to get offended, but not on them. There are a lot of people, they will say, well, okay, Kevin, my family have never practiced sorcery and we don't, we're not into that incest stuff and or witchcraft. Oh my God, we don't do none of that stuff. But your family was involved in secret societies. Your family was involved with fraternities, sororities. And in those places, they had to make pledges. They had to make agreements. Who were they making the agreements to? Were they making it to Jesus Christ? No. So we see now the Alpha, Kalpa, Delta, all this other stuff, these Greek goddess and so on. You see, listen, let's go back to the rules now. Don't get mad at Kevin. Let's go back to the rules. The rules are clear. Uh, Exodus chapter 20. In fact, let's turn there. Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to come right back here to, uh, let's go to Exodus. The same, same Exodus 20, but let's go up to the earlier verses, beginning at verse 1 to verse 5. Exodus 20 verse 1 says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Listen, listen, verse 3. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. Small g. Verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under, so that is in the water under the earth. Five, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Now, let me put a pin before I go any further. So a lot of these, for, and that's why they call it a secret society, but the secret is here. Let me, let me expose it right now. The secret is there are covenants that are made that are not supposed to be disclosed with anyone else. But it is these covenants that the folks who are in it are ignorant to that is tying up their spiritual life. And there are now limitations. So the trade-off is, okay, we will let you excel to a certain point. So you see a, a, a fellow sister and brother who work at a corporation, who pulls some strings, get you inside, you climb up the ladder. That's all beautiful. That's a distraction, though, because the reality is what you spiritually did when you made pledges, when you made agreements, when you had to do certain ritual to climb up the ladder, you are literally incarcerating your human spirit 
you are giving that altar the right the, the over, over your will. So there are certain things that's not going to take place in your life, but you will never connect it or trace it to that particular fraternity, sorority, or whatever it is, Freemason, Eastern Star, whatever you were involved with. Now, when people hear this, they become offended. And I say to them before, I, I had no dealings with writing the Bible. That was God and his men. I had nothing to do. I, all I do is read it and give it to you. You could forget it or move on. <laughs> the point I'm making here is these are the impediments that we are ignorant to that has now become the hooks in us spiritually and has anchored us spiritually. And spiritual law dictates that what, whatever, whatever, in order for something to be, whatever happening physically, it was manufactured for, or conceived from a spiritual perspective. So the enemy, through these covenants, was able to lock down destinies before people even were born. And I'm about to prove it right now. So verse 5 of Exodus 20 says, because you remember he's warning them, do not serve any other God, do not have anything to do with these things, don't be making no covenants, don't mess around, no altars, none of it. So verse 5 of Exodus 20 says, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. And watch what he's going to do if you decide to disobey what he's saying. He says, now as a result of your disobedience, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers. That was the evil that they did, the covenants, the, the pox, whatever. I will visit it upon the children, that's the current ones, and at minimum to the third and fourth generation. So that means, Prophet Tiffany, if you were to go right now to some altar and make some sacrifice, your great-grandchildren who don't even exist are cursed already. In fact, the curse is waiting on them. So whenever they are birthed into the earth, the, rest, the spiritual restrictions are already on them. So there are certain parts of, of their lives, if not all, where they will only go so far and come to a complete stop. Where we see this mostly, especially with, with, with educated women and so on, we see it in their relationships. Now, why is this? Well, if you were to go back to their mothers, grandmother, great-grandmothers, you'll see where they had certain affairs and wanted a certain person and couldn't get them. So they went to see a witch doctor, a voodoo priest or whatever. And they said, okay, fine. We could get you this, but we will need that or whatever the case may be. So once that covenant was made, more than likely they would get the person. But there would be no peace between them and that person. Because what's keeping that relationship or causing that man to love this woman is a spirit that was sent from the altar. A spirit of lust, not love. So yes, he, he, he thinks he loves her, but the truth is he hates her. He cannot stand her. He will sleep with her, but even after that, they're fussing and fighting all the time. But in that covenant was slipped in there the spirit of divorce, the spirit of anti-marriage, the spirit of rejection. So that person spiritually is marked in life. No matter how beautiful they are, no matter how educated, fellas will dig them. They will jet set them all over the world. They would send them chocolate, roses, Valentine. They will send a whole farm in there to their workplace for them, but will never marry them. Why? Because there's a spirit attached to that person influencing any form of prospect that when they get to a certain point, the relationship is going to be shut down. And every relationship shuts down the same way where the fella just pick up, walk away for no reason. And wants nothing to, in fact, accompanied with that uh, ending the relationship spirit, attached to that is a spirit of rejection where you, well, the lady becomes, she, he's totally repulsed. He literally hates her, but she did nothing to him. And the more she tried to make contact with this dude, the more he hate her because there's a spirit that's on him designed to make him hate her. So guess what happened? And this is how you know it's an altar. She's going to meet another guy, and the cycle is going to start all over again. The cycle is going to start all over again. And so she's before the pastor. Pastor, what do I do? What do I do? So he take like three, four bottles of olive oil, hit it across her head a couple of times, and you know, but still ain't going to change nothing because there's still a covenant. Right. Now, here's the key. And this is now where the dreams, because with every covenant, 
there would always be glimpse in the spiritual realm as to the source of it. So the person who has this curse over their life as a result of this altar uh, covenant that was made, they now begin to have dreams. And in these dreams, they will either see themselves being married, see themselves having sex with someone whom they're familiar with, which will now be uh, masquerading or familiar spirits. And the reason why they're masquerading as someone familiar, especially if someone who they had a crush on or who, someone who they have affections for, is because behind that masquerade is the spirit of anti-marriage. It's the spirit of rejection. So what will happen now to renew the covenant that was made eons ago at the altar, the spirit is coming masquerade to win the trust of the victim in the dream. When the victim decides to have intercourse or permits the intercourse or kiss or hug or do whatever, the covenant is now reenacted all over again. So now that same cycle starts all over again. But if the victim is ignorant to this information, they live their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Beautiful, beautiful, educated, have their life, their home, everything. But no guy, because the covenant is speaking. Now, I know folks are saying, but but I'm saved and, and, and I'm not cursed anymore because I have Jesus and, right. and all of this stuff. Uh, listen, my people perish because they lack knowledge. Listen. What Jesus did at that cross, and I want to be clear with everybody here. Well, before I even said it, let me put it this way. If there were no more curses on your life as a result of you accepting Jesus Christ, you should, have, you should never be sick. You should never be broke. You, In fact, you should be the poster child of perfection. If you believe that when you accepted Jesus, the curse has been taken by Jesus. Instead, what Jesus did at that cross by disabling principalities and so on, he has now enabled you to use his name to break curses. He says, curses anything that hangs upon a tree. So the curses that were following you, you have the right to break it in the name of Jesus. And I cast this on Jesus. I have nothing to do with this anymore. Jesus is the one who's going to take this. This has nothing to do with me. But what we're being taught, and, and this is what compounds the curse, we, because I've seen many ministers, and they're telling you there's some women in here who are not married, and the Lord is telling me right now, bring $6.9 million, put it at the altar here, and God is going to send all kind of curly hair fellas here, and you can just pick whoever you want. Nonsense. <laughs> Nonsense. The only, the only thing that can break that covenant is the blood and the name of Jesus. But you have to realize that there is a covenant in place. If you don't know that, then you're going to be going around the same mountain over and over and over. To the point, some people even abandon Christianity. Why? Because of a lack of knowledge. And the Bible says in Proverbs 11 verse 9b, it says that through knowledge, what we're talking about right now, shall you, the just, the Christian, the believer, be delivered. So this scripture is telling you that even believers need deliverance. Because there's a scripture specifically saying that through knowledge, it didn't say shall the sinner be delivered. It didn't say the, the, the Satanist, no, tr through knowledge shall the just, which is synonymous with the righteous, which is synonymous with the upright. Deliverance will come to you, believer, when you grab a hold of the word of God, knowledge, and now make applicable as opposed to living in fantasy land. Oh, I'm not cursed anymore. No, so what if I'm 109 and I'm not married anymore and have no children and nobody looks at me? Not everybody's supposed to be married. Right, you didn't say that 30 years ago. But anyway, the point I'm making here is that when you have the knowledge, now you have a new weapon to use. The weapons you were using before were the wrong tools for this particular job. The only way you could break this is, uh, and I want you to write the scripture down, uh, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 40. And, and God said to the children of Israel through Moses, he says, now you must not only repent, of your iniquity, transgressions, and sin. And this is a powerful scripture because this is the only time, because once a person is deceased, you cannot pray for them to say, Lord, forgive this. No, this is the only time in scripture where it said that in order to break up these things, you must not only repent of your sins, iniquities, and transgression, but that of your forefathers or ancestors. Oh, God, back up. 
my deceased grandfather was dead 6.8 million years ago. You're telling me that I could come before your throne and ask the forgiveness of what he did as it relates to serving other gods? Yeah. This isn't going to get him in heaven. Let's be clear here. What this is doing, this is the protocols to now severing and divorcing yourself from the evil covenants that they never did when they were living. But here's the power of it. Even though they're deceased, the power of the covenant, the power of that altar did not die with them. Because all the spirits at the altar needed was the agreement of the human being. That was already achieved. We don't need him anymore. Unless one of the stipulations at this particular altar is where the covenant has to be renewed every so often. But even that we don't need it because what will happen now is the spirits themselves will now come in the dream and have intercourse with the individual reinstating the covenant all by themselves. So let's go back here now to Exodus chapter 5, sorry, 20, verse 5. He says, Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, and I'm going to visit the iniquities upon the father, upon the children, unto the third, and the, listen, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, here you find a clause in the law. What this clause is stating here is that, let's say Kevin went to an altar years ago. When people teach generational curses, they say, well, if your family was involved in sorcery, the generational curse fall on everybody. No. Now, everyone is susceptible to it in the sense that the, the, the clause here is, he says, I will visit the iniquity on your children and the third and fourth generation, and this is the clause, of those that hate me. Now, who are, who is this those that hate me? Well, in the book of John, Jesus says, those that love me will obey my commandments. So, Common sense shall tell us that those that hate him are those who are not obeying his commandments, right? So those who reject the word of God in that family, who was exposed to the curse, who was exposed to the covenants, those who, re those who refuse not to get saved, those who don't want to obey the rules, the laws, principles, ordinance, precepts, commands of God, these people have no idea. Is that they're literally jumping up in life. Hey, I want the curse. Sit me here, sit me here, come here. I want to be cursed, me right over here. But they don't know this because they don't know the rules. They don't know the laws. So the more you run away from God, the more you are open to this curse. So this is why you see some family members are under the curse and some are not. Right. And the reason for that is because those, they don't know by default, once you rebel against the word of God, then by default, the spirit that was introduced to the family through the covenants at the altar have every right to run its course in your life unhindered. And you ready for this piece? There's nothing God can do. N no, he will be violating his own law. That's right. So this is where the believer, this is why the Bible says, you believer, you must work out your own salvation, which means your own deliverance in this situation. Don't depend on a, a prophet as Tiffany or T.D. Jakes or Kevin Ewing or whoever your favorite preacher is. They could pray for you. They could jump kick you, do all that stuff. But at the end of the day, if you are not applying these rules, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time, right? So let's go back all the way down here now to verse 24. Same chapter, right? Exodus 20, verse 24, he says, And an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offerings, and thy peace offerings, thy sheep, and thy oxen, and all thy places where I record my name. I will come unto thee, and I will bless, and I will bless thee. So, this principle is telling us is that God says, when the specific instructions by the deity at that altar has been performed by the, the human, then the spirit is going to come. In this case, God is going to come, and God is showing. Now, the principle is God says, when I come, I'm going to bring blessings. So, when you go to an evil altar for whatever reason, and this is what they will not tell you, the spirits that you're making agreements with are going to bring curses. Think about it. If the good altar of God is going to bring blessings, then the opposite is also true. So no matter what you went to that altar for, whether you went to get a promotion on your job, whether you went to make somebody leave their husband or wife and come and marry you, whether you went there to be successful, it doesn't matter. What does matter is that you went there, whether you're aware of it, 
and you're looking for solutions and remedies from the devil. So it is through you seeking that solution, whatever it may be, he now slips in some bonuses for you. So you came there to be wealthy. Well, that's not a problem. You, you're going to be wealthy. But with this wealth, we're going to slip the spirit of infirmity. We're going to slip the spirit of divorce. We're going to slip the spirit of poverty. But nobody is telling you that. So as you begin to live out your life, you notice that some weird stuff is happening. But if you're very analytical in this, it all started the day you made the agreement at the altar. So he says here, he says in verse, uh, the ending part of verse 24, he says, I will come. God says, I will come unto thee and I will bless thee. Verse 25 says, and if thou will make me an altar of stone, thou shall not build it of huge stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Stick a pin right there because you're seeing some more principles. Now, some of you who probably was into sorcery or the curiosity, or you was just straight up wicked. Nevertheless, the reality is here, every altar you went through, there were specific instructions. Some altars would say, okay, bring two white candles, bring four eggs, bring a pint of liquor, alcohol. Once you get there, bring a cigar, whatever. So the practitioner of that altar, who is also the mediator between the spiritual realm and this human realm, which we call the witch doctor, high priest, or what have you, he is the one who is in every, every practitioner, every, let me be clear here, every witch, warlock, wizard, every false prophet, every secret society uh, member is accompanied with a familiar spirit. This is the spirit through the communication system of divination and how they communicate with the spiritual world. So what they're hearing, you who's seeking solutions, you don't hear this. So the spirit is telling them, okay, now when you go home, the spirit is saying, in order for the spirit of prosperity to come upon you, do not take a bath for the next three days. Do not put on any deodorant or whatever it is. It is always going to be something crazy. Now, once you would have done that, follow those specific instructions, you're giving that spirit the right, which it did not have before, to now enter your life, and by extension now, that because it's going to be several of those spirits, is now monitoring every family member to see who is violating the laws of God to now levy the curses that came with the spirit of luck, prosperity, all of these other spirits are coming with it. So you see how one person could change the destiny of other people who have no knowledge of this all because of the covenant that they engaged in. So the scripture goes on to say here, God says, now, if you build this altar in opposition of what I'm telling you, listen to the words he's saying, you are now going to pollute the altar. And what that simply means is that the altar cannot perform what it was designed to do if you don't follow the instructions that were given to you. Verse 26 says, Neither shall thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered. So he says, now when you make this altar, now make sure all your clothes are on. Don't go there looking all half naked and so on. Again, if you violate any of these rules, then God will not come there and none of the blessings will come. Now, on the flip side to that, because I did a, I just started a teaching series on Saturday past, uh, Men Under Witchcraft Powers, and it has a lot to do with what we're talking about now. Where you have a lot of women who go to these altars to be married, to, to get men that they love, whether the guy is married or not. And that altar will require certain things of them, especially if it is to, what we call here on the island, hook the guy or make him love them. So what they would, once they go to the altar, the altar will say, okay, because there's several things that they do, but the most common thing that they will do is to violate a rule in the Bible that they're not supposed to do. For example, in the Old Testament, when a, a woman was menstruating, the Jewish rules was she had to be separated from the camp for, I think, about seven days. And no man was to touch. And if he did, the Bible says he would be defiled. And she would also be defiled, right? So at the altar of lust, what they're going to recommend to this lady is you have to get this guy to sleep with you 
while you are menstruating. Once that is done, you are inviting, to, they're telling out the spirit of love, that he will love you, but the reality is the spirit of lust. So this is why, even though he's going to be foot and foot behind her because of this spirit through this ritual, the reality is once he would have achieved his lust, once he would have slept with her orgasm, now he goes back to hating her again, cussing, fighting, there's never peace. Why? Because the connection here is demonically inspired by evil covenants. There are devils that's running the show. There's devils that pulling the string. So the, the reality is there will never be peace in that relationship. This is how you know the relationship is odd. So you're saying to yourself, why does this guy stay with this woman when they, they're always fighting? He cannot go because the spirit is keeping him there. His human spirit is fighting, and this is, this is the reason why it's like a con, one spirit is contending with the other because the guy, like, I don't love this woman. I don't. The only thing he finds pleasure in is sleeping with her. He doesn't respect her. He doesn't care. And, and she doesn't care either. She just want him home there. But he is not happy because he's home there. He misses his wife. He misses his girlfriend. He doesn't want to be a wife because there's a spirit holding him in. So the purpose of the spirits is to influence. It's to persuade. It's to encourage the human being. Why? Because they have no authority. So once they're given that authority, they're either going to do one of two things, depending on the strength of the human spirit. They're either going to uh, oppress that person, and when they're oppressing them, meaning that they're trying to encourage them to love them, encourage them to do things, but in their human spirit, they don't want to do it. They will end up doing it, but it'll always be a fight. That's the oppression. When the person is oppressed, meaning that a spirit now dwells within them, then the guy becomes a slave. Whatever is almost like, as if he is some kind of puppet. If she tells him to jump, he want to know the measurements, how high you want me to jump. So he has no mind of his own. He, everyone that is connected to him, his kids, his, his wife, his mom, the spirit causes him to, to sever himself from all of them. So it places, it isolates him. Mind you, when he gets himself, he have major bouts of depression. Why? Because his human spirit is still trying to fight. This is not me. What is happening? I hate how I feel. But at the same time, he cannot leave. Why? Because the spirits at the altar is dictating the course of his life. So a lot of people are challenged with these things, but they don't know. So they go to these churches and they sow seed and they jump around and they sing Jesus is a deliverer and all of this stuff they do, but they come right back to square one all over again because there's real spiritual implications that's pulling the strings to these things. They, are, they lack, they have no, no knowledge of this. So therefore they, they, will, they will repeat the cycle till the day that they die, living an unfulfilled life. Why? Because God has to honor the covenant. He have to. So he, that's why Jesus, th this, this is why now you begin based on this knowledge, you appreciate the new covenant. That's right. Right. You are, because the, 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 the new covenant has built in it where Jesus has already de destroyed the principalities that govern this. So the truth is the strength of those principalities and demons and evil spirits is fueled by the ignorance of the believer. The believer is trying to fight this without the source that he or she needs, which is Jesus Christ, to take this thing down. So what are they doing? The spirits are saying, now tell them, you tell them that there's no curses over you because G you, Jesus died for the curse and you're a Christian and you're not cursed anymore, even though guys are running in the opposite direction from you. <laughs> so, so their ignorance, again, has become the fuel mm. to such a miserable life. All right? Now, remember I said to you earlier, I said, with these covenants, sorry, with these altars, dreams are emitted from altars, right? And what that means is that when a person has a, a, a curse over their life that is fueled by altars, obviously, then that person now will begin to have specific dreams in relation to the specific curses that is upon their life. For example, a, a lady who having difficulty in finding a mate. And not just her, again, when she sees the pattern in the family, right? Then, of course, you'll have dreams where you're all about it. You're in a wedding. You see people getting married. You're getting married. Or you see this guy who claims to be your husband. Or you see someone putting a ring on your finger. Anything to do with agreement in that dream represents covenant. And all it means is that the spirits are coming, masquerading as certain things. Again, all in an effort to renew the covenant, to keep that 
that hex or that curse in the person's life consistent. All right. Now, with that said, I want us to go to, uh, I think it's, let me pull it up here. Let's go to First Kings, First Kings chapter 3. First Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, I think it is. First Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Right. First Kings chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, right? And it says, And Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of, Je of Jerusalem round about. Verse 2 of First Kings 3. Only the people sacrificed in high places because there was no house built unto the, unto the name of the Lord until those days. Verse 3. And Solomon loved the Lord, walked in the statues of David, walked in the statues of David his father. Only, listen, only he sacrificed burnt incense, incense in high places. All right? And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there for that was the great high place. Listen what he did. A thousand burnt offerings that Solomon offered upon the upon that altar. So a part of a sacrifice to God as a result of his inauguration as the new king, he went all out. I mean, he went all out for God. He was just elated that he has succeeded the throne from his father, David. And this fella did a big sacrifice on the altar. Now, watch what's going to happen as a result of this. So verse 5 says, in Gibeon, where Solomon lived, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. Why? Because of the, the sacrifice, the, the, the sacrifice on that altar, it caused God to now come to Solomon. But he's coming in, to him in the spiritual world, which is the dream. Now, God came to him. Now, we got to be clear. Solomon physically is asleep. So God coming to him in the dream, he isn't coming to physical Solomon. He's coming to the spirit man, the soulish man of Solomon. So the Bible says in verse 5 of 1 Kings 3, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Is he talking to physical Solomon? No. But what invoked the spirit of God to come to this man? The sacrifices that he made. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says in verse 6, And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Verse 7 of 1 Kings 3. And now, O Lord my God, Thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a, a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor count for multitudes. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may dis discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Listen, listen, verse 11. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches of thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Listen, listen. Behold, I have done according to thy words, Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee. Let me stop right there. Now, hold on. Back up. Back up. This is amazing. This is amazing. God is giving this guy wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. But how is he doing it? In a dream. Okay. So, let me put the pieces together. This guy popped up in your dream. And says, he's going to be your husband. Puts a ring on your finger. But he's a masquerading spirit from the kingdom of darkness. Meaning that the same way God could give this man something in a dream that's going to manifest itself in the natural world. Here it is, you're receiving something in this dream. Thinking it's just a dream. Having no idea of the spiritual implications that's about to tie up your life. To, con to, to cause you to continue with guys rejecting you. 
but you have no knowledge of this because as far as you're concerned, stupid dream, I get out here with that foolishness. But the Bible says God gave Solomon in a dream, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. In a dream, the Solomon is asleep. So he's adorning his spirit man. Hey, look here. I'm going to attach this. I'm going to put you, I'm, put up, I'm going to put on you the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding to judge, to rule, to lead my people. But where is this happening in a dream? So this is why you have to be so analytical when it comes to dreams. And I say this to people all the time and I do in my extensive teaching on dreams. If you've had a dream and you don't recall it, you don't understand it, it don't make sense to you. Listen, the best thing you could do when you would have awakened out of that dream, Father, if this dream is of you, then I come in agreement with it, with it, according to Jeremiah 29 verse 11, because you says that your thoughts towards me are good and not evil and to give me an expected end. So based on that scripture, God, I believe whatever you're revealing to me in this dream is for my benefit. So I bind myself to that. If this dream is not of me, if the enemy has caused me ignorantly to come in agreement with something that's going to be detrimental for my life, I reject, denounce, renounce, and divorce myself from every evil covenant in that dream. So this is, the, this is the information that has been blocking your breakthrough. This is the information that the enemy has been dancing and having all of his cheerleaders just having a field day. Let her go to church. Let her do the somersault. Let her do the cabbage patch in the moonwalk. Let her do all that nonsense in church. But don't ever let her get into this information because the day she get this information and actually apply it, deliverance is going to be your portion. That's right. So this is why we need to understand. We need, we need to, and I hate to say this, we need to stop playing church. Stop just saying that we go to church. It makes no sense if you go to church and do all of this stuff, but you're still bound. Mm -hmm. So Solomon, as a result of this sacrifice, invited God. Now, what is the equivalent of this today in terms of, Kevin, what could we do to invite the Spirit of God? Fasting. Fasting is the keynote speaker to immediately ushering you into the spiritual world. And of course, those of you that follow me, I do my teaching on Isaiah 58, where it gives you the protocol, give to the poor, and so on. And you watch, you watch the proliferation of dreams during your fast. And all of this, is, it's showing you excerpt in the spiritual world, because the spiritual world is where everything is conceived and manufactured. And earth is the mass distribution center for those things, whether it's of this kingdom of light or whether it's of the kingdom of darkness. So this is why when you if, you, if you want to have a look at your spiritual dashboard, will you go on genuine fast? And you will see exactly what covenants and so on. Why is it that every time you have a fast, you always see these dogs or creatures running after you? Why is it that you're always fighting these people in your dream? Witchcraft. There's witchcraft attacks, but this is the spiritual implication of it. It's what you're seeing fighting you, dogs, cats, whatever, human beings, grizzly bears, these are evil spirits masquerading at them, fighting your human spirit. Why is it fighting my human spirit? Because if they could lock down your human spirit, by default, you cannot exceed or excel or go forward physically. So this is why every time promotion comes by, you always have a dream. And in the dream, you see where they're giving out awards, but you never get none. You always see where the bosses come down, talk with everybody, but they never talk to you. So the dream is now saying to you, well, guess what? It's saying to you that something is going to go down in this place positively, but you're not going to be a part of it. So guess what? When they start to have the promotion exercise, guess who don't get a promotion? You. Right. That's right. But where did this happen? In the dream. But what did you were not proactive and challenge it? You didn't go on a fast right away. Father God, I see where the enemy is trying to block me again. But now that I came into this understanding, I break every evil covenant, every evil sacrifice, every evil voice speaking to my destiny. Father God, just like you rain down fire and brimstone on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm asking you to rain down spiritual fire and brimstone over every evil act against my life. Whatever's hindering me, whatever's delaying me, Father, pull up every spiritual demonic anchor that has anchored me to a place of non-progress. But you can't be saying this now. I lay me down to sleep prayers and think God is going to. That's not going to happen, man. So what I'm going to do is just pause there for one second, prophetess, and just let you shoot some questions at me. Okay. Well, first of all, me. we want to know how to break these curses, these <laughs> evil covenants, okay. and these evil altars. Beautiful. We I, what I want everybody to know is there's a difference between an altar and a covenant because sometimes people misidentify them and mix them together, but that's not what, what that is. And so um, defining the difference between the altar and the covenant, because a covenant has to be made with the altar, right? right? And then how does one break it? Now, I'm I got a few with that. 
because what I think is so fascinating is I often talk about abortion, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I shared my testimony. I got saved in my shower August 2015. And uh, I unfortunately had an abortion. But one of the powerful things about that is uh, for like a, a year straight, I had these, I had this abdominal pain, right? And it was just like consist. I went to the doctor, had ultrasounds, everything you can think done. And there was nothing that could fix it at that point because I was saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. I knew it was spiritual, but I didn't have the answer still. Fortunately, I went to a church service and there was this like little old white lady. She was in her 60s that gave a testimony that 10 years prior, she was sleeping with a married man. Right. Imagine how mind blown I was sitting there. Not that white people can't do nothing wrong, but you know what I'm saying? She's in the church. 60. Why are you sleeping with somebody's husband, ma'am? And she was a pastor. So that was just another story. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, she talked about abortion and all of that. So I remember walking up to her after service and I whispered, I was like, hey, thank you so much for sharing your testimony. Um, I I can relate. She said, did you have an abortion? And I was like, oh, it was a secret. But, you know, that's how I whispered a little bit. And I said, yeah. And she said, did you break the covenant you made with Moloch? And I said, well, I never slept with a man named Moloch before. So count me out. It's not me. Not my guy. And she goes, no, there's a covenant you made with a demon named Moloch. Did you break that covenant with him? Imagine me blown away because I'm like, I just got a simple abortion. Not that it's simple, but, you know, when you get one, when you don't know no better, you think it's simple. And she broke down how uh, blood is shed, right? When blood was shed on Calvary, a covenant was made. The new covenant Mm -hmm. was made. Well, when you shed blood on that table or however you choose to get it done, you now made a sacrifice to this demon in the Bible named Moloch who was responsible for uh, getting sacrificed children to him. Then she says to me, uh, do you have endometriosis or any pain in your area? And I was like, yes, how do you know? Mm -hmm. And she said, because with that covenant comes the spirit of infirmity. And I was like, what did I do? (laughs) I was just younger. I didn't know any better. Why wasn't I broke that? And do you know, immediately the pain went away. And so that's kind of what got me very interested in all of this covenants because so many things are made with, you just have no idea, even though not knowing that Planned Parenthood is synonymous with the occult. The woman that created Planned Parenthood was in the occult. She literally worshiped Satan. Her mentor was the same mentor that Adolf Hitler had. So this woman was into the extermination of the black race because she hated the Negro race. And she wanted to kill everybody off and created this wonderful thing called Planned Parenthood that the government funds. And her whole goal was extermination. And because she was in the occult, what better place to feed her God, Laura Case G, than to kill all of these babies all the time. And so uh, I often have people, whenever I minister anywhere, I often have people break this covenant that they made with Moloch because we know we can see the spirit of abortion all over your life, where you start things, don't finish, where things before they are birthed into fruition, they're terminated right away, Mm -hmm. whether that's relationship, anything, right? And so I just, uh, you know, along with that, I want to talk about, I want you to tell us how to break the covenants, but then also are there different prayers for different covenants? So the poverty altar that Mm -hmm. people say that they like, they're dealing with poverty. Is there an altar to poverty, an altar for barrenness? Because, you know, I don't think until we got into this age, we've seen so many women with fibroids, so many women all of a sudden pop up and these women cannot have babies. Obviously this is spiritual. What altar did they need to um, kill for barrenness? The single altar, the anti-marriage altar, the infirmity altar, you know? So give us a little bit of clue on how do we break these altars? Okay. Well, first of all, let me define the difference between the covenant and the altar. Then we will just go into how to break them. Well, the the altar itself, like I said, an altar could be anything that you set up for a deity. And based on what that that how the deity wants it to be uh, dressed or addressed, for example, in some places you will see where they'll have a table, and on this table they'll have a lot of fruits, some candles, and you see some people pictures. You'll also see like some people like hair strands of their hair or clothing, and you'll see like a padlock or something on it, or you'll see wedding photos of people, and the wedding photo you'll see of the husband, but the wife will have an X or black mark, but it's put in a bottle and it's uh, put on this altar or even buried in the ground. Now, all that simply means is that these people 
will now be victims of that altar. Because spirits are not omnipresent, such as God, where he could be anywhere, anytime, all the time, then those spirits need something to identify the victim. So this is why you see the personal stuff there or photos, pictures, and all this sort of stuff. Now, so the altar is the place, the physical altar is the place where you'll have all of these paraphernalia to do the whatever. The covenant is the agreement made between the spirits and the person. So they said, okay, we came here to shut down Kevin L.A. Ewing ministry, right? So they would say, okay, what are you bringing here for us? Do you have anything? Okay, we have a flyer here with him on it. So they put the flyer there. They do some stuff, blah, blah, blah. And in some cases, you will either see them like take uh, liquor, alcohol, and they would put this alcohol in their mouth. And depending on when the spirit will arrive, they will shoot out the alcohol with some fire on it. Or they will take a cigar, take a long draw, and blow it over the photos of Kevin L.A. Ewing. Now, if Kevin L.A. Ewing is not living right, this is key, if he is not living right, if he is uh, cheating on his wife or stealing the church money or whatever the case may be, and otherwise, if he have unconfessed sin in his life, he is going to feel the effects of this altar at that time. So wherever he is in the world, he will smell the cigar smell that nobody else can smell. He will smell the smell of liquor, alcohol that his wife wouldn't be able to smell, nobody else, because this specific altar is being targeted at him. Now, the next thing they're going to ask is to do a sacrifice where they're going to cut a goat or chicken or whatever, and then they're going to put the blood over Kevin's photo, his underwear, whatever they have there. This now is what is sealing the agreement between the deity and the human being to say, we want you to destroy Kevin's ministry. So the altar is the place where the covenant is established. Follow me? So that spirit now, which didn't have the will, the power before, is now going to be sent to Kevin. And it's going to monitor Kevin and look at ways to destroy Kevin's life. Again, if Kevin is not living right, he's going to have a lot of problems in his marriage. He's going to have a lot of problems in his finances. He's going to be having strange feelings. All of this is because of the spirit. So the next question is, though, Kevin, how do we break this? Very simple. Let's go to Isaiah 58. This is very, very powerful. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 58. Okay. Remember, uh, well, before we even go there, well, before we go to Isaiah 58, let's go to Mark uh, 17. Mark chapter 17. All right. So Mark chapter 17, and we're going to begin reading from verse 14. It says, And when there were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic, sore vex, for oftentimes he fallen into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure or heal him. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him here to me. Verse 18 of Mark 17 says, And Jesus rebuked the devil, okay, not the boy, the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said to him, this is the first nugget, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, hence yonder place, and it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible for you. However, this kind goeth out but by prayer and what? Fasting. So what Jesus is saying here, first of all, is that not all spirits are on the same level or have the same rank. He said in so much word that there are some spirits that when you pray, they will actually leave. But he says now, to understand that you're dealing with a greater force in terms of an evil spirit, if you've been constantly praying about something, marriage, finances, whatever, and there's been no change, then this is a different level of evil spirits. And in such cases, they can be connected to uh, evil altars. Let's quickly go here now to uh, Matthew Matthew. Matthew uh, 12, I think it is. Matthew 12. And let's look at verse 40. 
43, all right? Matthew 12, verse 43, okay? Because remember Jesus said just now, this kind will only come through prayer and fasting. So there's a certain level of evil powers that prayers alone is a waste of time. Literally, they're laughing at you mm -hmm. because based on biblical rules and laws, these spirits know that you could pray the heavens down. Unless you incorporate fasting, they will not budge. So Jesus now in Matthew, in Matthew 12 verse 43 is about to give us some deep revelation as it relates to evil spirits. So he says, now listen guys, when an evil or an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. So Jesus is saying, listen, evil spirits are just like you. They have legs, they can walk, okay? They get tired, they seek rest. So all of these are nuggets that people just read through the scripture and not stop and focus on it. He says, now when they find none, verse 44 says, then he said, who is he? The spirit. So the spirit can reason. He said, I will return into my house from whence I came. What do you mean your house? What, you got like a duplex, an apartment complex? No. He's referring to the human host as his house. Seeing that I cannot find an available person to enter, to possess, because this is the main purpose of a spirit to get into somebody. He says, well, let me go back to my former home. Now, remember, this, this spirit was evicted because this person was delivered. Okay. So verse 44 of Matthew 12 says, Then he, which is the Spirit, said, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swift, and garnished. So the Bible is now describing the spiritual state of this man, meaning that whatever he did to be delivered, clearly he is maintaining that. So therefore, this particular spirit cannot gain entrance. So what does the spirit do? Because he's an intelligent being. Will he go and look for this kind? How do we know this? Well, let's continue to read. Verse 45. Then go with he. Then go who? The original spirit who cannot get back into the sky because he's maintaining his level of deliverance that initially kicked the spirit out. Then go with he and take it with himself. Listen carefully. Seven other spirits not equal to him. No, I didn't read that. More wicked than himself. So we're talking about a different level of spirits now. Okay, more than himself, and they enter, no resistance, they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So what is the scripture saying here? He, he was maintaining his deliverance, obviously, because the original spirit couldn't get in. However, the spirit says, okay, I don't really looking for seniority here. I just need to get back in. So let me go get some of my homeboys who got more powers than me. I'm going to get back in. So while he maintained his deliverance to keep the original spirit out, he never upgraded his deliverance to keep other spirits out, and the upgrading it would be fasting. Mm -hmm. Hence, Jesus said in Matthew 17, verse 21, this kind, this particular group, will only come out and stay out through prayer and fasting. So with that foundation in mind, let's run over here now to Isaiah 58. Isaiah 50, I love this scripture, because it speaks about a genuine a genuine fast. So Isaiah 58, here we go, beginning at verse 1, all right? So God saying to, Eli to Isaiah, to the children of Israel, he says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Israel their sins. Yet they seek me daily, this is God saying this now, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. The acts of me, the ordinance of justice, they take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted? And they say, sorry, wherefore have we fasted? Say they, and thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our souls, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of thy fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labor. So the children of Israel went on a fast originally, right? And the fast that they went on, these guys were still living their regular lives still backbiting each other, cussing, just doing all kinds of stuff, right? And Isaiah now, as a prophet of God, God sent him to read the right act to him that this fast that you guys were on, this had nothing to do with God. In fact, this is all was a bunch of foolishness. Verse 4 says, Behold, you fast for strife. How could you be on a fi fast and still challenging one another? Behold, you fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. 
it is such a far sorry is this is it such a fast that i have chosen that's a question a day for a man to afflict his soul is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him will thou call this a fast an acceptable day of the lord so asking a question verse six is not this the fast that i have chosen so isaiah god is of course saying to him the fast that i've chosen for israel the genuine fast is going to deal with that situation initially from a spiritual perspective unfortunately for the one who's engaging in it it could be quite confusing to them because initially they're not seeing any physical changes so just to put a pin in here, just one minute, and I just want to revert to Daniel chapter 10. Daniel went on a fast for 21 days. So for 21 days, nothing happened. On the last day of the 21 days, an angel appeared unto him, right? And the angel now is about to reveal some spiritual intelligence to Daniel that he did not know, but all of this was going on within the 21 days. So the angel says, Daniel, thou beloved by God, from the first day that you went on this fast, God heard your prayer and God sent me. However, the principality of Persia, the Bible referred to him as the prince, because we know a prince is just a position for a, a principality, sorry. It's just the position of a prince that rules over a region, a territory, a family, whatever, right? So this principality that ruled over the province of Persia withstood the messenger angel that was sent to Daniel. And remember, all of this is happening on homeboy fast, but he has no knowledge of this. So just like you and I, we're like, God, we're crying our heart out. This is day 15. And I mean, the heavens have been thundered and lightened. our enemies weren't strikers yet. What are you going to do? So all of this activity is going on. So the angel said to him, Daniel, God sent me, but I was hindered by the prince of Persia. But while I was hindered, Michael, one of the chief prince of the kingdom of God, came and withstood the prince of Persia. So, so far, the only human in this story, <coughs> excuse me, is Daniel. We have the prince of Persia, and this is not a, a prince, a human. <coughs> excuse me. What this is, is a spirit that dominated the kingdom of Persia, the principality that ruled that region. So the only thing or the only spirit that could contend with a principality is another principality. So this is where Michael... The principality came in and challenged this guy. So I guess Gabriel, the messenger angel, can now come to Daniel. So he says to Daniel, he says, Daniel, I've said everything I've had to say to you. Verse uh, 20 to 21 of Daniel 10. He says, now I have to go back to fight. Meaning that that principality isn't going to let me shoot back to the third heaven, the paradise of God, without challenging me again. He said, but when I go, the principality of Greece... Because of all of your fasting and stuff, you, you cause all World War tend to break out here. That principality is going to now come here in support of the Prince of Persia. The point I'm making here, and for those of you who love to write me emails on this, I'd say, Kevin, I did this and I did that. Wait on God. You're not seeing anything the way you want to see it because things are happening, but not what you are expecting as yet. But there are forces in the spiritual realm as a result of your fast that all hell is breaking loose up there. Where people go wrong is because they walk by sight and not by faith, they now begin to nullify what's supposed to happen to them by making negative confessions. My God, nothing never happens to me. I've been on this fast for at least 200 times, I mean, 200 days, and and I mean, my Lord, look, look at the sinner man over there. He sends all he wants and God rewards him, but look at me over here. Life and death still resides in the power of the tongue. That didn't change. So here you are nullifying all of these things that are coming your way spiritually. But because of your ignorance in these things, you're knocking them out. So I'm using that scripture there to show you that even while you're fasting and even after the fast, trust me, there are, things go, there are angels at work bringing things together for you. But you need to continue to speak what you want to see. Continue to speak the word of God. Don't retreat into some negative nonsense. All right? So going back here now, with that in mind, back here to Isaiah 58, verse 6. So Isaiah says, it's not the fast that I have chosen for you. And what he mean by this is that these are the four initial things that's going to take place spiritually 
before you see the manifestation of things for you physically. So he says, is not this the fast that I have chosen? And what is that? To loose the bands of wickedness. But who he's talking to Israel. But there were no physical bands around them. What is he talking about? So clearly he's talking about something spiritual. You are through your unconfessed sins, your wickedness. And this is why you need to go on the fast. To sever the bands of wickedness. To have a band around you mean that it's restricting you from moving or performing the functions like you could normally do. If someone could put a band around me right now, I'll be jumping around like some kind of, right, kangaroo. And I'm limited to what I could do. So he says, spiritually, the genuine fast that you are supposed to go on, this is what it's supposed to do. So verse 6 is telling us what it's supposed to do spiritually. Is it not to break the bonds of wickedness? To undo heavy burdens. What heavy burdens? I don't see no heavy burdens on you. Spiritual burdens, you can't see them. And to, and to let the oppressed go free. Remember I tell you about the guy who won the witchcraft powers? He's oppressed. Mm -hmm. He's with this woman, but he don't want to be with her. So the, the Bible said the fast is to break this. And the last one he says, and to break every yoke. Okay, now, how do we engage this? How do we initiate this while you're fasting? He said, verse 7. Okay, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? This is what you should be doing while you're on the fast, praying, fasting, whatever. He says, you, the comforts that you once had, you should now seek and helping others achieve that. So this is why when you decide to go on a fast, okay, your mean cousin called from some other states and said they need $200. And you quick to backslide for five minutes and tell them where they need to go for that $200, right? But here it is, God is sending someone to you to engage the rules, to engage the laws. But again, you come in at it from a, spirit, from, a from a physical, fleshly perspective and messing up the whole thing. So he says, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry and thou bring the poor that I cast out of thy house when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him and that thou hide not thyself from him, from thine own flesh. So God is saying that while you're on the fast, you need to seek the needs of those that are less fortunate. That's the key component. That's in fact, this is the initial protocol to this fasting. Now, when you would have done that, listen what you're going to see. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Now, what he's talking about, he's talking about now, your understanding of things are going to heighten. I was recently on a 40-day fast, and those who follow me could, could tell you, my understanding of the scriptures, my explaining it is even deeper now. And this is here, this is the reason for it. Aside from your understanding, listen, he says, and thy help shall spring forth. He didn't just say spring forth, he said speedily. So something was slowing it down before. So he says, when you engage in the fast, it's going to bring some speed to healing you. All right? And thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Okay, listen to verse 9. Then shall thou call... And the Lord shall answer. So this means he wasn't answering me before. So what the fast is doing is resetting your life spiritually. Areas in which you were hindered and delayed. God says you have to do this fast if you want to reset. If you want to change things. Sometimes when your computer acting up. You don't know much about it. What you do? You cut it off. And then you turn it back on. You reset it. So verse 9 says, Then shall thou call... And the Lord shall answer, thou shalt cry, and he shall say, here I am. So before he was ignoring me, but I'm a child of God. <laughs> so he says, okay, we can fix this. Get on this fast. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vainly. In so much voice he says now, if this will happen, if you thou put aside gossip, put aside speaking evil of your brother, put aside making condescending remarks about people. Listen to verse 10. All right? And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, he's saying this again. He's reiterating this. So to reiterate something shows the importance of it. If thou, if thou, if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light, listen, arise in obscurity, and thy darkness be as the noon day. All of this represents revelation. I love verse 11. And the Lord shall guide thee continually. Hold on. So that means you weren't guiding me before. 
So you see the importance of the fast resetting things in your life. This is how to, 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 to undo that covenant, to reset you to your original destiny. Fasting is the only way that's going to happen. Whatever foolishness you're doing, you need to stop it because it's a waste of time. If someone is telling you so seed to break generational curses, that person needs brain surgery. Something is wrong with them. That The only way that can happen is true fasting. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose water fail not. This is the part I want to get to because this is what the Lord gave me as the revelation as it relates to breaking generational curses. Listen to this. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. All of this because of the fast. Thou shalt rise up, listen, the foundations of many. What is the foundations of many? Well, go way back in the past of the ancestors and the nonsense that did. He said, you will rise up the foundation of many generations. Uh -huh, and what else? And thou shalt be called, what are you going to be called? The one who is on the fast. You are going to be called the repairer of the breach. What breach is this? When they altered your destiny. When they went to the altars and made covenants. So he says, the fasting, you, you, not only are you able to break it, but you're empowered to break other people's curses because of the fast. And what did he label you? The repairer of the breach. What is a breach? A breach is when you violate a law. A breach is when you break the law, when you, when you did something contrary to the rules. So when a person went to the altar, they was in breach of the laws of God. But Kevin, what It was a breach was of contract. Right. When you breach a contract. So the breach here is, I went to the altar when I shouldn't have gone there because in Exodus 20, beginning at verse 3, he says, you should serve no other God. You should not bow to them, serve them, and whether in the heaven or whether under the sea. And if you do this, this is the penalty. The penalty is because I've breached it. So he says, now, when you reset things in your life through the fast, you have now been deputized as the repairer of the breach. You have the authority to pray over people and break the curses in their lives as well as your own. Okay, so Don't let me stop you there. You didn't go so, on the fast. Because we had a lot of questions about, do you have the legal right to break other people's yes. curses? Yes. And that scripture just made it. Because listen to what he's calling you. You are the repairer of the breach. You are the lawyer in your spiritual lawyer. You're coming fully regaled with the anointing as a result of this fast to break the curses in your bloodline. So this is how you break curses. You, you, you do not break curses by back flipping and do nonsense because until you could give me the scriptures to support this gymnastic stuff you're doing and how it moves demons, then it's nonsense. So the scripture is making it unequivocally clear to us. This is what you do. Now, with this though, all of this is by faith because a lot of people will probably do this and every two minutes looking around, you know, to make some guy supposed to come and marry them or a bunch of somebody supposed to come through the door and give them $6 million. No, every day you walk by faith and believe in God. I myself, and I'll just end with this here. I myself was riddled with curses. Poverty. I said I the best way I could put it, I had a combo package when it came to curses. Me. Right? <laughs> I had it all. Poverty, bad relation. I mean, you name it. And it was through fasting. And this is the reason why I promote fasting so much. It was through my original. I did many fasts prior to 2011, April, going into March, when I did my first 40 day fast. That came as a result, prophetess, through desperation. Mm -hmm. I, I I went to church, I sat with pastors, I no one could have explained to me or helped me. And they did what normal church do. You know, we're gonna pray for you. Nobody told me about the repair of the breach. Nobody told me none of what I'm telling you right now. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I don't knock them. I thank God for them because what they did, as well as those who were attacking me spiritually, was pushed me in areas that I would have never gone before, such as fasting, such as praying more, such as begging, and they got to be more to this Christian walk. So what they did to me was, was tip me over the edge, take that die over. And what that did is cause me to plunge into the word of God, seeking there has to be some scripture that is giving me a concise protocol mm -hmm. 
to sever these invisible barriers or to knock them down in my life. When I did that 40 day fast, at that point I was, I worked at FedEx as a courier. I was a courier for years, couldn't get promotion, couldn't get ahead. Educated guy, just couldn't go ahead in relationship. My finances was, you name it. After the 40 day fast, uh, nothing happened immediately, but it wasn't long before after that. And the first thing that happened to me was I got a promotion on my job at the latter part of 2011, which doubled my salary. Uh, I was an account executive. They hired me. My ministry took off. I was getting a whole heap of invitation. And each year, the blessings was flowing, flowing, flowing. I had invitation to Europe. I ministered over there in America, the Caribbean, all over the world I'm going. All because of these teachings I was doing on YouTube, writing these articles. I had a space in the local uh, newspaper and as well as our national newspaper. And things just began to open up. I met my wife. We got married. Prior to that, I had lost some, uh, some apartments I had. The bank came and relieved me of that. Uh, when I said everything that could have gone wrong went wrong, I ended up back home with my mother. I had no money in the bank. I had a son who was preparing to go to college. Everything that could have gone right went wrong until I engaged in the fast. And this is why I say to people, if you're a Christian and fasting is not a part of your Christian discipline, then you will not see breakthroughs. You will not see turnaround. Now, you will see it in other people's lives, but you will never see it in your life. So you have to make that sacrifice. This is when I learned more and more about dreams, and I know that I had the gift of interpretation. But the fasting enhanced that. So this is why I would say to anybody, until you break those covenants in your life, and this is why you need to do it. You hear what that scripture says? It says, you will become the repairer of the breach. Now, let me tell you what else that means. That means that when you engage in this fast, and God has anointed you or deputized you as the repair of the breach, then you are also responsible through that anointing for breaking it in other people's lives so that they can be released to do what they're supposed to do and touch the hearts of others and recruit them to the kingdom of God. So this is not just about Kevin or Tiffany or whoever else. What God has placed on us isn't for us. It's for a people. And you sitting on that gift the reality is you're sitting on the destinies of other people. Mm. I'll end right there. <laughs> wow. That was, wow. That was deep. Okay. So let me ask this. I know you're ending, but let me ask this because a lot of people are like, what, what are the words do I use? So somebody asked a very important question. They said, do they need to know exactly what covenants they're going to break? Like, do they need to list them out? And then what are the exact words? So for instance, uh, Father, I, I break the covenant of blank. That right. what, what do they need to pray is what they're wondering. Okay, here is what, first of all, you would never know the exact covenant that is made. However, there are red flags that will tell you. For example, if you see a curse of anti-marriage, you see a curse of poverty, you see a curse of cancer in the family, curse of infirmity. So these here are the symptoms of that altar. This is the evidence that an altar is in place. So you write those things out. When you pray now, and this is something that I discourage people in doing, a lot of people purchase uh, books with prayer points and so on. And, and I mean, there's nothing really wrong with it, but let's go at what the Bible says. God says, listen, a contrite spirit and a broken heart I will never despise. And sometimes you got to put that book down and come raw before God. And that's what I used to do. I say, Lord, I've had enough of this, man. I'm tired. I am tired. I am depressed. I am broke. I am busted. Help me. Then you go, and Father, I have a curse of poverty. There's a curse of sickness. I'm, I'm a curse of anti. Write it down and say, I need to be delivered from this. But if you just go and buy some recitation or some whatever, you need to really put your heart into this. See, when you're desperate, you have no more shame. That's right. Yeah. See, because what shame does, shame, shame become a regulator. Only so much you will do because you don't want to look embarrassed. But when shame, when that regulator of shame is alleviated from your life, you don't care no more. You would go in the streets and cry. Back in the Bible days, they used to get out in the crowd and put on sackcloth and ashes. Some of them get naked because we have had enough. So until you get to that point, 
that means that you're still prepared to entertain what's, op what's oppressing you. So at the end of the day, what I would suggest, look through your family bloodline, look at the negative patterns, write them down. Because when you go before God on your fast, these are the things you're going to bring before him. And the, the truth is, even if you don't do that, you speak against the altars of anti-marriage, the altars of poverty, the altars of confusion, the altars of fear. Many people listening to us right now, there's a curse of fear in their lives. Yeah. Anxiety, panic attack, they, they're anxious. All of this is to cause them to make a uh, wrong decision. So my advice is I have a teaching call on, uh, I have a teaching uh, call, I think Teach Me How to Pray or something like that, where I really break it down in terms of just like how you were talking to me right now, Tiffany, this is how God wants you to come to him. That's right. Sometimes I jump in my car, go on the beach, sit down, and I know people passing, figuring this fella here ain't right because I'm in there talking with God as if somebody was right there. And I'm like, God, how do you want me to take this position? I mean, whatever. So that's how you have to be. You, you cannot talk to God like he's way in the skies. Yeah. No, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you for I am always with you. So you have to believe that and you have to talk as if he's right there standing up waiting on your next words. And you say, Lord, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of, I'm tired of being embarrassed. I'm, I'm such and such an age. And look, I'm looking at my peers. I'm looking at everybody getting ahead of me. And it's unfortunate that I didn't know these rules and principles, but nevertheless, you promised me, according to Joel 2 and 25, you said that you'll restore unto me the years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palm worm has eaten away. You said in your word, according to Proverbs 11, verse 31, that the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. You said to me, according to Hebrews 10, verse 35, that I must not cast away my confidence or belief in you, for it is this confidence and belief that shall work for me a great recompense of reward. You said to me, according to Ephesians 3 and 20, that you are always willing to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all that I ever ask or think. In fact, you said that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead resides in me. So you, you, this is how you talk to your God. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to go, oh, Jehovah God, the great one, and all this other stuff, well, if you got time to waste, go right ahead. But for me, I need some results. <laughs> so I don't have time for that. So you just got to take it from that perspective. Gosh, that's so good. Tell everybody where to find you. Yes, face, well, YouTube. You can uh, find me on YouTube. Just type in Minister Kevin L.A. Ewing. I'm on YouTube. I have five pages on Facebook. I also have a Twitter page, but I also have an Android and an uh, Apple app. Just type in Kevin L.A. Ewing Ministries or Minister Kevin L.A. Ewing. I can't remember it. And I have all of my information on there. I specialize in dreams, dreams interpretation, spiritual warfare, Anything to do with the spiritual realm, we go deep into our teaching. I'm not a surface teacher. I do spiritual surgery. And the whole idea is that those that listen walk away with an understanding to make applicable what was said. So this is why I say to people, when you come in to listen to me, do not, it's, it's a disrespect if you're not bringing a pen and a notepad, <laughs> okay? Right. You should have that information. But all of my information, how to contact me or whatever else you want to do is right underneath the uh, comment section of YouTube. It's pinned to the very top and you'll find all of the information. I have also a blog site, Kevin L. Ewing, uh, dot blogspot com. All of that is there also. I have over 600 articles on there. And of course, they're in categories, dreams, spiritual warfare, witchcraft, you name it. And again, it's deep, deep teaching. And I post different articles every day to encourage people on my community page on YouTube and so on. Because again, what I want to do is to cause people to be better than I am because I'm quite confident in what I'm called to do. I love it. So I'm not on no competition with anybody. They could compete, but not me. And I just want people to be better and fulfill what God has called them to do. That's good. I got one more question. If you no, have time. just one more. Okay, good. More. So a lot of people ask me about having dreams about past houses, like childhood houses that they live in, right. um, whether they see their parents there or a familiar spirit in the masquerade of somebody that they love. What does that that childhood house represent? And during your prayer against altars and breaking evil covenants, do those houses disappear in your dreams? Well, I don't know if they'll disappear, but house in a dream normally represents a person's life. In fact, in that same scripture I gave earlier in um, Matthew 12, verse 44, when the Spirit says, let me go back to my house. 
And of course, that was just symbolic of the human being. So whenever you have a dream about houses, first and foremost, it's speaking about an individual life. If it's an apartment complex and so on, it's more likely speaking about a family or even a company. But whatever the dream is going through at that time will be relative to that symbol. Now, whenever you're dreaming about old houses or houses that you grew up in of the past, if it's a one-time dream, then you could kind of discount it. If the dream is repeating itself, it's speaking about generational stuff. Mm. In those houses, if you're dreaming about your grandmother or your grandparents or whomever, what you look at now is what exactly are they doing in there? Let's say you see them in there uh, having sex. That's not good. Mm. Or you see them with an altar or doing something that is evil. Again, what the dream is revealing via symbols is things that they did that is causing the negativity that you see today. So that's a sign that you, the repair of the breach, after doing the fast, need to break some generational curses. So even if you don't know what it is, Father, whatever my ancestors have done, I repent. Because this is the only rule, uh, Leviticus 26 verse 40, where this is the only time where you could make a prayer on the behalf of a deceased person, all in an attempt to break a curse that was left in place by them that they never dealt with prior to their demise. So in terms of even after the fast and so on, will you still dream about the house? Well, I, I don't know about that. What I do know, though, again, as a spiritual law, based on what we said in Matthew 12, verses 43 to 45, that spirits, as you would have read in there, when the spirit was cast out and he made the decision to go and revisit the guy, no place in there where you would have read and Jesus stopped him. So what that means is that spirits have a right to revisit. Now, re-entry is a different story, uh -huh. but it has a right to revisit and tempt you. Now, the problem with this, uh, Tiffany, is that people get confused when a spirit revisit or re-temp and not being delivered. Uh -huh. For example, let's say they went on a fast to, to stop masturbation or sexual mm -hmm. thoughts. So the minute they came off the fast, they had this sexual thought about their ex-boyfriend or whatever. So they start getting, ah, I'm not delivered. I'm, I'm, that's not true. The Bible says, and the spirit went and revisited. He has a right. Now, this is where you come in with spiritual understanding. And now you challenge that spirit. And how do we do this? Well, let's go to, I think, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. Casting down all imagination and anything and everything that exalts, exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So you, you have to sit, talk to it. Spirit, I resist you. I reject every evil thought, every evil desire. Sometimes you're looking through your phone on Facebook and you come across some sexual thing. You just came off a fast knocking these things down. The Bible says shun the very appearance of evil. That's right. So you have to engage the laws. So this is why I tell you, people who say, oh, Jesus Christ died and, and he's a curse and I'm not cursed anymore. That's being lazy. There's a part that you play. Hence, the Bible says that we are heirs with God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Partnership. So with G Jesus did the heavy part. He went on the cross. Mm -hmm. He took the 39 stripes. He had the thorns on his head. He was hung. He was stabbed with the spin aside. All of this to reconcile us back to God. Now we through the verdict of the cross, have to now push that verdict so that when these demonic forces come in, he says, now, whatever you ask the Father or do in my name, this is where it comes in. So the curse can be broken now through this new covenant. Mm -hmm. But don't believe that you could just sit there and the curses are just going to pass you like you have some kind of Batman shield around you. That's not going to happen. That's right. Okay, if, if that's what you're thinking, man, listen, you live in an Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> okay. I, I have, I'm open for any questions, so you don't have to restrict it. Whatever. Oh, question. good. Okay, perfect. Um, somebody said you're so great at memorizing the word, and somebody said, "No, he's not memorizing. He knows <laughs> the word." Can, can I just stick something in there? It's Please. another for somebody. Yes. Listen, it is never, ever, I want to be clear with people, it is never your responsibility to recall scripture. That's not your responsibility. The Bible, Jesus made it very clear. That's right. And guess I guess I never did it. I'll tell you how it happens. The Bible says, Jesus said to the disciples, hey, look, I'm going to die. I have to leave you. But when I leave, I'll not leave you comfortless. I will send the Holy Spirit. And this is his job. A, to guide you into all truth. 
Two, to convict you of sin. And this is the part when it comes to scripture. He says, and to bring to your remembrance the things Christ have said. It is your job not to recall scripture, but to meditate on scripture. And meditate means to murmur over something, repeat it over and over. Now, what is that doing? It is feeding your human spirit. The evidence of this, Tiffany, is that when you get into conversations like I am right now, the Holy Spirit is responsible for retrieving what you've put in you That's and right. now bring it to, bring it to your remembrance. So I love this because whenever I do my international teaching and so on, people are always marvel that, man, I want to recall the scriptures like you. And then when I tell them what they're supposed to do, and I'm like, wow, I never knew that. Right, you're not supposed See, because trying to recall scriptures, you're trying to show off. <laughs> you're right. Trying to, right. No, let the Holy Spirit, he will only do what he's supposed to do when you do what you're supposed to do. And that is, your job is to feed your human spirit. And the only food that this spirit eats is the word of the living God. That's so good. So good. Now, people often, when they hear you say 40 day fast, they try to mimic exactly what somebody did to get the exact breakthrough that they got. Right. But can you speak on uh, people wanting to do a 40 day fast now and people just doing a yeah. one day fast or a three day fast or, uh, you know, what kind of fast do people need to do to ensure that these covenants and altars are broken once and for all? OK, good. Now, first of all, I will tell every and anybody when it comes to fasting, that is between you. Excuse me, and the Holy Spirit. Let's be clear with that. Now, I could recommend, and some persons will say, well, Kevin, the Lord hasn't told me anything and, and whatever. Well, I will make a recommendation, but my recommendation is in law, is in rule. So what I would normally recommend from those who feel that the Holy Spirit hasn't said anything to them, first of all, have you fasted before? Because I would never tell you to go on a 10-day fast, 5-day fast, if you've never fasted before. Next thing I know, you're calling me from the hospital for prayers. <laughs> so what I would recommend to people is a three-day fast, maybe even two, but it all depends because if you have severe generational curses, you really need to hear from the Holy Spirit. Right. You really need to hear from him. And this is where, again, if you're not hearing from him, this is what I would advise. Get into the word of God. The Bible says in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, I believe it is, and it says that the word of God is like a double-edged sword, cutting asunder spirit and soul. And it is also a discerner, right? So what it, what it means is that it is, when you read the word of God, it, it already knows what you're dealing with. And the scriptures that you're going to be led to read is not by chance or accident. God is speaking to you. Right. How do we know this? Well, Psalms 103 verse 20 says, Oh, how excellent is the Lord. How, oh, how excellent are angels in their strength who hearken, sorry, oh, how excellent is the Lord in their strength who hearken unto the commandments of God and the voice of his word. So what the scripture is saying, the word of God is the voice of God. So whenever you're reading the scripture, it is the voice of God speaking. That's what you're hearing. I'm saying this to people because they take the Bible for granted. You know what? Let me go read it because they always tell me to read the Bible. You're not just reading Bible. This is Jesus Christ. Scripture says to us in uh, Revelation 19, verse 13, uh, John, vision that he had on the Isle of Patmos, he says, and he saw a name that was given, meaning to the Son of God. And that name was the Word of God. Uh, John, Math, sorry, John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that the Word became flesh. Who was that? Jesus Christ. He was the Word of God. First John uh, I think 5, verse 7, and it says that there are three that bear witness in heaven, God, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. So the Word of God is Jesus Christ himself. So when you read this, and that's what I tell people, people call me, oh, Kevin, I need you to pray for me. I need you to do this for me. You need to build confidence knowing that you're reading Jesus himself and believe what this word is telling you. And I try to discourage people from believing that. I know if Kevin pray for me, I know it's going to be better. That means you have confidence in me and not the word of God. Mm -hmm. So I'm begging people, develop a relationship with God. And the best way to do that is by feeding your human spirit. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 24, I think verse 5, it says that, or verse 10, I think it's verse 5. It says, if, if one fail in the day, faint in the day of adversity, his strength is weak. 
And he's not talking about his physical strength. He's talking about his spirit man. And the reason why I speak, because he's not feeding it. I think verse 10 says that a wise man, uh, anyway, I can't remember, but in both cases, what it's talking about that when it comes to the things of the spirit, you build your spiritual strength by gorging and feeding on the word of God. The evidence of this is going to build your confidence in the word of God. But if you're looking for a preacher or prophet or bishop or someone to do this for you, you're in breach of the rules. It's not going to happen. So good. So I have three more questions to ask you. We have tons going on, but I do want to remind you, Minister Kevin has a wealth <laughs> of information <laughs> on his YouTube page, his website. I mean, a wealth of information. So if your question doesn't get answered here, please, please exhaust uh, all of his channels because I can't imagine how much time that even took to teach. It's a wealth of information. So uh, one person or a few people asked about fibroids and I mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. how just so many women are, uh, gosh, just plagued is the right mm -hmm. word with mm -hmm. fibroids these days where we didn't necessarily see that before. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe birth control had a lot to do with this plague. Um, but what do you say about that? And uh, what do you say about that? And how do you break that off? Of well, it? fibroids is the result of, for example, you mentioned the abortion. And remember the lady told you that with that comes the spirit of infirmity. Matriosis. Totally correct. Yeah. Right. Totally correct. But that also comes Which with- Which the doctors did not, like there was none of that in the in the natural yet. Right. But it would have manifested, pending. I'm sure, had I have not broken that covenant. It would have been pending. Was, yes. Pending. What it also comes through is fornication. Fornication is another avenue. Adultery, having sex with somebody else's husband or wife. You're inviting the truth. Now, how do we prove this? Again, wherever we're violating the laws of God, by default, curses will fall upon you not necessarily generational because generational come through idolatry, but the curses are automatically levied on a human being. Once they are in violation of the laws of God, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning at verse 15. And it says, if thou shalt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord, thy God and observe to do all of his commandments, then shall these curses come upon thee and overtake to overtake means to go ahead. It's now going to become generational. And then he says, curse shall thou be in the field. Curse shall thou be in thy storehouses. Curse shall thou be in thy body. But whoa, all I did was disobey it. Right. So therefore, whenever a person remains in unconfessed sin, he or she is also vulnerable by default. God cannot stop Satan here or these evil spirits. They now come. Hey, we got the right now. We're going to levy uh fibroids. We're going to levy ovarian cancers. We're going to levy this. Now, if you continue to read in that same Deuteronomy, because from verse 15 all the way to verse 67 speaks of the curses. I believe verse 21, 27, somewhere around there, he says that he will also give them incurable diseases such as the broils of Egypt, listen, and M. Rods. Now, when we look up hemorrhoids, you're going to see two definitions. One, it would say it means hemorrhoids. But no, what it means is tumors that cannot be healed. Tumors that cannot be healed is cancer. So you see, when you allow sin to continue in your life, by default, the enemy can now and levy curses on you. Now, this has nothing to do with generational curses because that only comes through altars and covenants and so on. But regular curses, and curses would be poverty, sickness, confusion, fear, all of these other things, they come as a result of, and you know one of the main facilitators of this? Unforgiveness. I speak mm. a keynote speaker keynote speaker to the audience of sickness, disease, and curses. That's right. Next question. <laughs> Gosh, that's so good. Do you know God had me one day, somebody wronged me and they were wrong. And do you know God had me a 
apologize to the person, which my God tested every bit of the I spirit know. of humility I, I didn't even know I had. I mean, I said, just, I can't do it. Like, But he showed me because of that person's unforgiveness towards me for a fault I didn't do, he showed me the spirit of infirmity attacking their body. So I had to then humble myself in order for them not to get hurt through sickness mm -hmm. to just say, I'm sorry. So they could let go of right. the faux unforgiveness. But every time we fast, I, I, I pound on unforgiveness so much because I have a revelation on how dangerous it is. I wouldn't mm -hmm. care. I mean, some people just need to pray for the gift of mercy if it's hard for you, because forgiveness is like almost one of the strongest keys to freedom that people don't know, especially with the spirit of infirmity. Well, let me add to that. And I'm going to shock a lot of people right now. Do you know there are many people right now listening to us who are Christians who have been saved for X amount of years? And do you know a lot of them right now, if they were to die, they will go to hell, even though they claim to be Christian? And let me tell you why. And for, for something that seemingly is very simple, Scripture says to us, Mark 11, verse 25, he says, while you are praying, this is the believer he's speaking to. You must forgive others so that conditional, your heavenly father can forgive you. What that means is that you've been holding it in for someone for X amount of time. And you feel, hey, look, they offended you. You have a right to be unforgiving. But let me show you how much you're skating on thin ice. According to that scripture, even as a believer of Jesus Christ, every time you committed a sin or did wrong and you say, Lord, please forgive me for my lying, for my stealing, for my cheating, for my whatever. And you go to sleep thinking that God has forgiven you. Well, according to the laws, he didn't forgive you because he said this forgiveness is conditional for you in that for me to forgive you, you must forgive others. So your forgiveness by God has been suspended because you refuse to forgive Kevin or whoever it is. So when you tell people, I'd be like, no, I'm a child of God. And if I, he said, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of them and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Yes, he did say that. And he also said, forgive others so that I will forgive you. So forgiveness in the body of Christ, Satan used as a real deceptive tool because what he does is he make the one who's guilty of it justified and what they're doing by levying on them. And I did a teaching on this called the spirit of offense. And that is something everybody should watch because that spirit, it, it also, it, it, it basically makes the person a foolish person in the sense that they feel because of their offense, they have a right, That's right. a right to, to, to do what they want to do and not forgive. And, and if they die and stand before God, to be sent to hell. They're going to wonder, how could this happen? And that's why Jesus said, there are going to be many on that day who's going to say, Lord, Lord, haven't I done this and haven't I done that? And he tell them, go straight to hell. I don't know you. That's right. <laughs> go ahead. That's so good. Okay. The second question. So God told me this year, 2022 was the year of the bride. And that had obviously a twofold meaning about the bride and Christ mm -hmm and us with the church and what's going on this year with the church, but also about supernatural marriages. And so for the women and the men on here that are believing God for their spouses, break these covenants and altars and curse, uh, what act of faith needs to be done after that to push that through? Or is it nothing that needs to be done? We just know by faith that it's done and let God do his perfect work. Right. That's a beautiful question. And that is where this particular spiritual rule come in. You know, the Bible is very repetitive with this statement, and it says that the just shall live by faith. That'll be found in Habakkuk, Corinthians, Galatians, and as well as Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Galatians chapter 3, verse... Anyway, it's mentioned about three to four times in the Bible, right? <clears throat> what that is saying to us, First of all, let me break it down. Faith in its essence literally is the word of God. So when the Bible says to us, we should live by faith, it's literally saying to us, then we should live according to the word of God. So that means whatever I went on that fast for, I am not listening to anything. Let's say I went on there to deal with anti-marriage. I must believe according to the word of God. The Bible says that it's not good for a man to be alone. 
The Bible says he that find it will find it a good thing and obtain it favor from the Lord. All of these scriptures to show you that God wants you a part of your happiness during your tenure on this earth. He wants you to engage in these things, right? So with that said, I must speak, decree, and declare what the Bible has said and decreed after that fast, as opposed to listening to people talk junk, but, oh, there's no more good men. My God, men are not faithful anymore. I, I don't get away from me. Leave. See, you don't need to be entertaining that junk. What you're doing, you're going to live by the word of God. Now, why is this important? Well, according to uh, Hebrews 11, verse 6, very clear. He says, it is impossible. And the story reader, it is impossible to please God. Now, you want to satisfy the one who you want to bring your spouse, who you want to relieve you of this enormous debt, who you want to take this cancer away from you. He says, okay. It is impossible to please me without this faith. So in layman's term, what he's saying is that just how money in the earth realm we use to exchange for good and services. That's right. Well, for good and services from the kingdom of heaven, you better bring your faith. Faith is a currency. You better bring it. <laughs> so he's saying it is impossible to believe me. So what that means, that's why I keep reiterating the just shall live by faith. You must live by what the word of God says. That's it. I don't care what the boss says. I don't care what the doctor says. I am believing. I'm repeating it. I'm meditating. We are, we are advised to, to, to take the word of God, to meditate it upon a day and night. That's in uh, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 and Psalm chapter 1 verse 2. He says to meditate upon a day and night. And then you shall become like a tree planted by the rivers of water that shall bring it forth your fruit in your season. Your leaves shall not wither, and whatever you put your hand to shall prosper. All of this, why? Because my confidence is in the word of God. But you don't have a degree, so what? But you're not handsome, so what? But you're not pretty, so what? If it ain't coming from the word of God, which is faith, you're speaking Spanish to me, and I barely understand English. <laughs> so, no. No, so faith is the keynote speaking. Just to add to that, Going back to Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What does that mean? Well, to understand that, let's now remove the word faith and let's supplement it as what it is, the word of God. Mm -hmm. So where it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the word of God now becomes the substance mm -hmm. of what I'm hoping for. And what is the substance? The substance is the material in which something is made up of. So faith or the word of God so, for example, you're saying, well, Kevin, you're believing God for a house. So what is, what is, what, how, how does work in? Well, the Bible says, well, faith or the word of God is the substance of what I'm hoping for. So I look for the scriptures, which is the word of God as it relates to my house. And uh, I think is Deuteronomy 11, somewhere around there. He says, I, God, will give you houses you did not build, vineyards you did not plant, pools you did not dig. That's faith. So when I go to God, believing God for a home, God, this is what your word says. I'm By faith, I'm believing this. So he says, I'm hoping for this house based on what the word says. The scripture goes on to say now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. This faith is also the evidence of what I cannot see. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, what does that mean? How, what is the evidence, Kevin, that you're going to get this house? The word of the living God. So you have any money in the bank? I may not have that, but I have the word of God. So you have some connections in the bank to help you to get the loan. Am I speaking English to you? I said, I have the word of God. So the Bible expects for us to use the word of God or live by what this word is saying to us. Not, on when, not when we have trouble, but it must be a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So faith is in only when I get to, and this is why you see a lot of people in churches today, they, they will never experience miracles and breakthrough because they have the tradition of when Sunday come, it's when I lift holy hands and, and do the, the backflip. I do the backflip over here and do the cabbage patch and all that other foolishness and then go home, eat some collard greens and stuff and come right back next week and perform the same circus again. What God is requiring from his people is, I want to see you living according to my word from Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and start all over again. Yeah. We cannot just 
Only when we get into problems, all of a sudden, oh, Sister Tiffany, could you join me in prayer and come and agree with me and stop everything that you're doing, you know, put your life on pause, okay, and help me just pray for Pookie over here. No, <laughs> no. So faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of not things, and it is impossible to satisfy the God whom you want to do miracles for you if you are not bringing him faith, bottom line. So good. So good. Okay. The third and last question for today. Somebody asked, and the reason I picked this one out of all of them is because I just get so I'm over it with people giving their money to all these false prophets. Mm. I, I hate it. It's a special mm. hate that God mm. has put on the inside of right. me. <laughs> right. And uh, I believe in honoring people with right. your money. If that's what you mm. choose to do, I believe mm -hmm. in all of that stuff. But when somebody tells you this, so I just, I, it's something that you know. it just does it on the inside of me. So somebody asked a very powerful question. They said, when you sow money to a false prophet, mm -hmm. is that you now coming into agreement with an evil altar and an evil covenant that you now need to break? Yes. And I'm going to mm -hmm. prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Where so are you going to go? Are you going to go over to Ezekiel 14, 4? No, 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 no. I go to Revelation. <laughs> okay. Well, I go to Revelation. Because this is something that I teach. And if my follow those that follow my ministry on here, they know what my position is on this. All right. I have no problem. Let me make my disclaimer. I, I believe in advancing the kingdom of God. I, I've sown in many ministries. Yes. What I don't believe, Tiffany, is that there's no way in the world, no human being could convince Kevin Ewing that you could put down the word of God and give somebody monies and right. God is going to do what he promised you from that word by you not doing it, but by giving them money, that will never that's right. happen. That's so that, right. that's to me, that's nonsense. So let's go to Revelation chapter 16. And I want to just bring a scriptural reference to that person's question. I'm happy that they brought it up. Revelation chapter 16 and beginning at verse 13 to verse 14. Okay. And you're going to discover some revelation right now. Satan mimics everything that God does, okay? Right down to the Trinity. Because there's a Trinity of the kingdom of darkness, which we're about to read right now, right? And one of those persons in the Trinity is whom we're talking about right now as it relates to this question. So Revelation 16 verse 13 says, and this is John again on the Isle of Patmos. And these are the visions that he was given from the Lord. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs so the spirits weren't frogs but they had the likeness of frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon which is satan out of the mouth of the beast which is the antichrist and listen to the last one out of the mouth of the false prophet so the false prophet is the last person in the trinity of the kingdom of darkness that's number one number two this scripture is unequivocally clear and it says where the spirit, these spirits were coming from. And they were coming out of the mouths of these persons, right? Drop down to verse 14, okay? Because it's going to tell you more about these spirits. It says, for they, which is they, the spirits, are the spirits of who? Devils. So let's put a pen in there right now. False prophet came to your church, whoever church you went to visit. It says, come here, you, you, woman of God, come here, come here right now. The Lord is saying to me, so while he's saying this, according to that scripture, which you cannot see, there are evil spirits that's coming out of them. But listen, mm. listen, he gave you a false prophecy and he says, the Lord is saying to me right now, I hear God, I hear him right now. And God is saying to break the back of generational curses. Now, I just showed you from scripture, being a repairer of the breach, how to break them, right? But this clown is telling you something totally different, right? So he's saying, the Lord is saying, you need to sow a seed of $1,000 right now, right? Remember what's coming from this man, evil spirits. So he says, man or woman of God, do you believe that God can do this here? So, so what are you doing? You're coming in agreement with evil powers, with evil spirits. Not only that, you're now putting as a sacrifice for quote unquote, what you want, your money is on the altar. This is why I say to people all the time, this seed business in terms of working miracles came from an occult background because in the world of the occult, the spirits are usually paid. But the truth is spirits cannot spend money. But this is a part of the sacrifice. See, sacrifice meaning that you're giving something that is great to you in exchange for something greater. So for this spirit that's coming out of this false prophet mouth to have any legal right in your life, 
there has to be an agreement. So even if you don't say, I agree to this prophecy, when you gave the money, that became the symbol of your agreement. Mm -hmm. So that from that point forward, Margaret, they shut everything down in your life. So for those of you that have done that, which is probably 99.99999% right. of you, right. just go ahead and lay that at the altar as right. well when you break right. these covenants and curses. Break it. Because it happened uh, to me. It's happened to me. Mm -hmm. It happened to me for that to it's break it. It happened to the best of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ah, so this was uh, powerful. <laughs> Great. Beautiful. To say you. the least. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you for you. your wisdom. Um, and we just thank you for the Holy Ghost on the inside of you that has allowed us to see a teacher teach. So we appreciate it. You guys, for those of you that don't know, I have a fast that God has charged us to do at the ministry he has gifted me with called Covered by God. And we fast the first three days of every single month at all times. The next Beautiful. fast is coming up on the first and uh, it is a God fast. So if you would like to join us, go to coveredbygod.co. Again, that is coveredbygod.co. And make sure you check your spam folders because sometimes the call-in detail lands in there. You guys, this was great. Please go over to Minister Kevin Ewing's uh, YouTube. Go and subscribe to his YouTube channel. For those of you that are seeing me for the first time, subscribe to my YouTube channel. We also have Covered by God in uh, two days. And so we will be live for that. And it's going to be fire, not because of me, but because God said so. So right. join us. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank we you. love you so much. Thank you Thank for your you. time. Love we you will too. see you again because everybody yes. is like, bring them back. So right. it's got to happen. Beautiful. You guys take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.